Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Did you know this is our one year anniversary? If you've been with us from the beginning, I just want to say deeply from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for being with us. Today we are talking about Dolos and Gattari, particularly their plateau, the faciality plateau from a thousand plateaus. Today we are joined by a friend of ours named Sean. He does a podcast called Buddies Without Organs. He joins Will, Matt, Adam, and myself as we delve into one of our favorite topics, Deleuze and Gattari. Before we get started, I just wanted to say if you're interested in more Deleuze or Deleuze and Gattari content, join us on Patreon next weekend from the release date of this. We are going to do our third installment of the Difference and Repetition Seminar. What's more, we are on Twitter. We're active there. If you have questions or just want to vibe in the community, come check us out. Okay, let's embark on our journey to find out what Deleuze and Gattari have to say about the face. Let me introduce you, Sean. So this is the Acid Horizon podcast, but this is also going to be the Buddies Without Organs podcast, which features Sean, uh, Matt C., who folks know if they've listened to this show, Matt Colhoun, and Corey from Australia. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, uh, I'm Sean. Uh, I have been uh, podcasting in some variety or another for the last four years. Ooh, question mark. Expert. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, it must be four years this year now. Actually, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I do a podcast called Buddies Without Organs with uh, Matt and Corey. Uh, Matt, like uh, like you just said, you know, listeners of Acid Horizon will be familiar with Matt because of his. Uh, um, his blog Xenogothic, and uh, Corey is a science fiction writer based in Australia, um, and uh, yeah, he and I have been kind of like Twitter confidants uh, for a couple of years now as well. So yeah, basically, Buddies Without Organs. It's a podcast about uh, Deleuze and Guattari that um, I approached Matt, uh, asking if he'd be interested in a project like that uh towards the end of last year uh basically because you know lockdown had a ton of time on my hands and i really just kind of decided that i wanted to spend some time learning more about deleuze um because by that point i had read anti-oedipus a couple of years before because i kind of like went through a period where i was quite interested uh god forgive me in nick land and his uh yeah the cottery around him and i decided like you know kind of should go back to the source a little bit and uh, read uh, read anti-oedipus and i think that uh set me on the uh on the right uh, trajectory really and i cut yeah and i just decided about deleuze and guattari more slightly more deleuze than guattari but obviously you have to take the two of them together in a big way were uh, philosophers I wanted to know more about. And I just really just kind of like realized that that would be a really good way of producing some podcast content. Uh, because I, um, like my academic background, I have a, a master's degree in philosophy, which I got a couple of years ago. And I think uh, something that, uh, I, I know that some of you are like PhD students, but I don't know, quite know like what everybody's academic relationship with philosophy um, is. But um, uh, for myself, you know, I found that once I started doing a little bit of philosophy many years ago now at school, you know, like it's never left me. I've always been, I'm always reading some philosophical text or another uh, or at least trying to so you know in a non-academic you know purely um civilian so to speak um situation i just decided i wanted to carry on learning specifically about deleuze because he was a figure who i'd never like been actually formally um taught like um taught at a university or anything uh i decided to just try and kind of do it myself a little bit. And I had um, some experience podcasting, have a, a podcast which is uh, currently on hiatus because my co-host Lucy is uh, finishing off her master's degree at the moment, uh, which is Weird Signal, which is about, um, uh, really it's kind of like about horror films and philosophy, but we have kind of expanded it into sort of like dealing with um films which don't exactly fall within the genre stuff is a little bit more avant-garde uh, and so on uh and that's just yeah, and that's largely led to a focus on like critical theory and psychoanalysis um 
yeah so that, that's that's me basically and uh once we kind of got but these are buddies without organs going it wasn't long until um some you know lines of alliance had been struck with uh everyone here at acid horizon many hearts that's right <laughs> and 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 I just really liked what uh, what you were doing uh, with this podcast. Like it's you know, it was it was the kind of like podcast that you know if I had like a, a lot more wherewithal, I uh, would absolutely love to love to do. So you know, I slid into slid into the DMs and said, oh, "Hey, <laughs> may, 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 maybe we can like collaborate. Please ask me onto your podcast." <laughs> And uh, yeah, here we are here, and here I am on a lovely on a quite well, actually quite a, a blustery Sunday night. Awesome. Well, I think the one uh, very respectable aspect of your endeavor with Buddies Without Organs is that you acknowledge, look, you're you're not an expert with this material. You're using the podcast as a way to work through it. And I think what you're attempting to do there brings to bear on our discussion here today, which is you are rupturing the dyad between the expert and the novice. And here we're doing it across the Atlantic Ocean right now, which is, uh, you know, we're taking our own line of flight to do this. And anybody who tells you they know Deleuze uh, and Guattari front to back or, you know, you know, position themselves as an expert, either they're like one of five people on this planet or they're lying to you, <laughs> right? So there's, there's, uh, there's always something to learn. And and in fact, like stuff that you have mentioned on your podcast has been very thought provoking to me, especially your most recent episode on the superiority of Anglo-American literature, which I, I really love. So everyone should check that out. And, and I'll, of course, I'll post that in the um, show notes. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, something that I think anybody in any kind of um, public arena talking about, I guess anything, anything at all, actually, always has has that imposter syndrome thing going on there mm. and i always get worried before recording that i'm going to say something really really dumb like i'm going to totally misrepresent uh deleuze and or guattari or i'm going to um i still get embarrassed when i like mispronounce like the stupid bloody french names in these books as well like <laughs> yeah. it's a um so it's yeah so kind of like trying to be sort of upfront about the fact that you know i do have a philosophical education uh, you know, I, I have, uh, you know, I have my, I've got my undergraduate degree from UEA and my uh, master's degree from Sussex. Uh, but I'm not an academic. Uh, I have a day job. I work full time. And so this is, this is a hobby. And it is, it's, it's philosophy, philosophy is hobby, really, which is something, which is the kind of thing that I, I, I can, uh, I'm remembering that dialogue at the beginning of, um, of the Republic with, where I can't remember who it is, but when Socrates arrives at a dinner party and the host tells himself, oh, I like a little bit of philosophy in an evening. Now I can't go out drinking or fucking anymore. So, well, I mean, like capitalists, like he's clearly not going to have like, um, uh, happiness in, in the Socratic sense, right? <laughs> so, but I, like, I, the one thing that, that I appreciate about Buddies Without Organs uh, is explicitly that I am allowed to go into the episode with like the same amount of vulnerability that you folks enter into with, right? So it ends up being not this act of having to like prove to myself as I listen through it that I can follow you know, certain individuals on the podcast, but instead, like, it's, am I learning with them? Right. Um, so for that reason, I think Buddies Without Organs is like a, an extremely unique project. Because if you can't engage with philosophy this way, well, 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 what good is it? Right. Like, right. if it can be confined to like a handful of journal articles on like, how the term faciality changes between, I don't know, um, a thousand plateaus, machinic unconscious and the cinema books then that's fine but like if, if you can't operationalize the, these these words for yourself and the way you perceive you know social relations or whatnot uh or however you want to deploy it uh what good is it so for that reason i think buddies without organs just it just rocks <laughs> think about um imposter syndrome there's something one of the things i, I think about Deleuze guitar particularly a thousand plateaus is that they almost give you license and almost encourage you to not care so much about whether you've got the sort of the correct definition that the authors have defined in advance. They, they, like, they, they encourage you to just you know, have some fun with it in a sense, right? Um, oh, pick yes. a page and then pick another page and try and make connections that they weren't thinking about. Um, so obviously there's no, like, you know, there's like always limits to it, but it's, it's, I've always enjoyed a thousand plateaus precisely because they just, they encourage you to have this 
sort of creative uh, reading of it. And even in, even in like Deleuze's like anger in in Letter to a Harsh Critic, he still gives uh, readers this sort of nod to just treat these these works as toolboxes, right? So like, okay, I don't understand how this fucking thing works. You throw it aside and you find the hammer that you like, right? Uh, yeah. So that's my and that really is what my relationship with uh, Deleuze and Guattari is, um, because my like I said, I wasn't I've never been taught Deleuze and Guattari academically. They, they were not figures who featured on yeah. the syllabus anywhere, um, any of either the universities I've studied. Same. At. And like the and the philosopher who I came to really feel an affinity with at university was Martin Heidegger. And that's uh, an affinity which has like become more critical over the years and was never a total supplication. I mean, for the obvious reasons of his, of his politics, that's not possible to do in good faith. Um, but the, and so the relationship I have with Deleuze and Guattari is that kind of playful, um, operationalizing of them because I like, um, I, 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 I started like this podcast, I started this podcast, I, this podcast because I wanted to learn more about them and not because I wanted to be a Delusian uh, and not because I was already a Delusian and wanted to spread the uh, the gospel. Uh, my relationship with Deleuze and Guattari is that I, I, I found them uh, fascinating. I find them infuriating and I find engaging with them just productive uh, on a personal level, like very early on into our conversations, uh, Matt used the word generative to describe the experience of reading Deleuze and Guattari. And I keep coming back to that, that I find something joyously generative in engaging with them. And I do engage with them quite critically. I'm like, and I have said this on Bodies Without Organs, and I'll say it here, I am not a Deleuzean. I'm still not a Deleuzean. I do still kind of think of myself as a Heideggerian or post-Heideggerian in, in some cursed sense. And so when I, 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 I find that what Deleuze and Guattari have done for me personally is they've acted as uh, a corrective almost in some sense. They've... Um, helped me uh acknowledge failures and risks in the heideggerian and greater phenomenological project which i was kind of blind to in in a way uh so it that's um that's why i still why, why i still do it i mean it, because it is it's fun and there is this in a thousand plateaus in particular, but I think you do see this in, in their other works. There's this playfulness in Deleuze and Guattari, which is like as I was saying, is totally absent in Heidegger, who's a very serious German man. Uh, while with Deleuze and Guattari, it's it's fun. It's fun to read them, and the way reading Heidegger is never fun. Like reading Heidegger is often moving, but it's not fun. And there is something significant in that, and and it does reveal it, it not only does it reveal elements of the characters of these different philosophers you know i imagine that actually i think dilly's probably be quite boring at a party to be honest with you but um at the same time he'd probably be uh, a lot more fun to hang around with than heidegger would be and as well as that the, it, that does also say a lot about their philosophical projects well, he, well heidegger's project is uh, extremely conservative obviously it is about this um a reclamation of the origin of tradition and a um a rediscovery of the source of our thought and so on uh while and that is reflected in the his obsession with etymology for instance this this like uh, this very rich like and his and the metaphors he uses you know going through finding your way onto the path through the woods for instance uh while with Deleuze and Guattari that playfulness um speaks to uh, an experimental disposition uh a a journeying disposition and obviously the notion of the journey the line of flight is something that comes up again and again and again in their in, in their work right in a way that you cu you couldn't imagine heidegger being that enthusiastic about traveling anywhere outside of germany um while there is this kind of um and you see this with the um essay on the superiority of anglo-american uh, literature where there's and, and some of that um, appears in the plateau and faciality, which obviously we're going to be talking about, where there is not only is there's this um, love of um, the lo the flight outward, but there's also the the love of the figure of the traitor, and there's a sense perhaps 
you can see Deleuze, Deleuze and Guattari being traitors to French culture by asserting the superiority of, you know, the, the traditional enemy of French culture, you know, Anglo-American culture, uh, and, say, and saying that, no, actually, they are freer, they have a better grasp of what modernity actually is and the traps and pitfalls in uh, the traditions we've inherited than we do. We're too serious, we're too Catholic, we're too guilty, um, while the, the British and the Americans want to rip themselves apart the line of flight. Yeah, they were mid-century edgelords. <laughs> Sean, can you, can you explain Deleuze to me? Um, please? No. <laughs> If I could, I wouldn't have started the podcast where I tried to learn about yeah. Deleuze. Maybe, maybe the first place to start would be like, what is the White Wall? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Well, tell us, you tell us, what is the White Wall? Uh, I'm wondering, like, the way in which they start is they, they, they want to create sort of a bimodal, uh, not exactly sort of directly semiotic system, but a sub sort of semiotic system where there are there's like the white wall of uh just pure significance and then periodically or in an expansive sense there is this process of subjectification which they're going to see as sort of a puncturing of a black hole into that that white plane um and it's going to be the spread or the expanse or like that's going to determine how a, a sort of face manifests in this white wall black hole system. But my question then becomes, probably everybody here understands the process of subjectification, but where is there an initial presence of significance? How does significance manifest in this system? Okay, so we, we have this notion of a white wall and a black hole that appears on the white wall. And in order for the black hole to appear, there needs to exist a white wall and vice versa. The presence of a white wall presupposes in some sense the existence of black holes that do that populate the white wall. One of the things that I, I tend I focused on in, in reading it this time was the notion of a speculative ontology on the part of Deleuze and Gattari here, they kind of ask a chicken and egg question like, hey, which comes first? Does a black hole land on a white wall or does the the white wall, is that the conditions for the possibility of a black hole existing there? First of all, maybe the best way to go in, in at it is talking about subjectification and black holes, because one of the things that they say about a black hole is, is that it lodges consciousness. It lodges uh, passion. And it's the site of the redundancy that allows the face to appear, where a face projects a certain kind of power, which is the construction of binaries, the construction of dyads, and the overlay of a grid on a political field, a socius, or what have you. And the white wall is about bouncing back certain intensities and taking in others. Right. So I think thinking in these sort of binaristic terms is a good way to start here. There are things that go into the black hole that get sucked in. There are things that actually get emitted from the black hole. And Gattari specifically here is using theoretical physics as a as he's kind of stealing from that model to construct this philosophical model of the face. Here's one question that remains for me after reading this. Um, not not necessarily what did Deleuze and Gattari say or mean, but what are the conditions for the possibility of their even experiencing a black hole or a white wall or recognizing or acknowledging these things as ontological entities? Because one of the things that they want to say is that in art, and, and he alludes to uh, Kafka's novella Blumfield, and he also alludes to uh, the ballet of Debussy and Nijinsky uh, about the, the appearance of bouncing ping pong balls and tennis balls as these sort of prototypical eyes that appear in a space. But it, I, one of the things that they emphasize is the movement of these eyes and the positioning of these eyes as being the condition for the the construction of the subjective black holes. I guess I wanted to ask at this stage, just for purposes of clarification, both, both for me and perhaps for any listeners who've tried to read this chapter and then struggled with it, would it be fair, fair to say that the overriding question of this chapter is 
how do faces sort of show up as faces in the first place? And how do how does what we call faciality, you know, this process of faces sort of registering um, in, in, our experience, in our experience, I guess, how does this relate to structures of political power as well? Um, how does it relate to racism in particular? Um, which they, that, is, that, is that a fair sort of summary of what we're trying to investigate for this idea of faciality? Yeah. And, 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 and you just said something that made me want to go back and sort of qualify everything that I said prior <laughs> to that, which is that there, they want to suggest that there are mixtures of semiotic systems. There are discursive ones, such as language as we understand it. And then there are these non-discursive ones. It's as if the picturality of a face, the figurality, the figurative aspect of a face has a certain command structure to it or command functions, as does language. And for like, if you read Gattari's work, his solo work, he'll talk about there being no language in itself. It's as if there's semiotic particulate that forms around notions of grammar and constructs la constructs language as we know it. And the same goes for faces, too. There is no a priori face or a universal face. But there comes a point in, in history through which semiotic assemblages come together and produce the face by necessity in order to produce a certain kind of social power and political power. So does does that mean that the that there's kind of a political discursive formation that must presuppose any given facialization? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily discursive because they will also emphasize that there's non-discursive elements within the power yeah. structure too. Well, the face is quite weird. It seems like how they're talking about a face, mainly for one, if you're just gonna break it down to the most basic visual metaphors in the idea of um the black holes and the white wall, essentially you know, what is the most basic element of a face? It's this bordered pair of black holes we tend to think of as, as eyes. You know, we, we see them, we recognise eyes in them. And given the metaphor of this, of this white wall, this surface with these two dots in it, these two holes, these two absences in it, they're trying to, to talk about the face as being something, in a sense, two-dimensional. There's, there's two modes of the face as when you construct it. And that's of, um, of being recognised, being unrecognised, yes or no, friend or foe kind of thing there's a binarization to how we construct faces but faces for them are primarily the combination of the effects of uh, you know the, the production of the wall and the production of the black holes so there's a bordering of these black holes there's in a simple of what say what you draw like a very basic eye what's the very most basic drawing of the eye you can do it's uh, a white circle you know a, a literal border drawn around some whiteness that's encompassing itself a huge black hole in the center of the pupil. And it seems like fundamentally the idea of facializing is the idea of bordering, of containing. It's an activity of, of containment and capture, which feeds into these patterns of, of binaries, yes or no, recognize or unrecognized friend or foe kind of thing. This is where the political dimension seeps in. And that's why I think also they don't reduce it to phenomenology and they construct this notion of the abstract machine of faciality because they don't want to preclude certain a certain political or even, I mean, I hate to use this word, but a material dimension to it where material means we can talk about actual physical structures in reality constructing the face as we understand it too. All of these semiotics you know, come into play. So there is an abstract notion of the face and an abstract notion of landscape. And the way that I'm reading it is there are real faces and real landscapes that get inserted into these abstract slots and instantiate these, uh, these more abstract notions. I mean, the, the, the sentences, you don't so much have a face as you do slide into it, right? right? There's this like judgmental, I don't even want to say normalizing power, but there's this sort of on the basis of the binarization, there are these structures that can sort of uh, either, you know, uh, initiate a stop or go sequence, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that that will be sort of the mechanism that will allow Deleuze and Guattari to then sort of reinsert the political on the other end of that analysis and say, like, actually, one way to do this is to start to become sort of imperceptible. I, I think normalize normalization is probably a good word, though. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just, I'm always hesitant to just like force <laughs> those terms into the discussion. But I, I think it's maybe a helpful way of thinking about it because it, it at least on my reading, I, I honestly, I did, I did struggle with um, this chapter, but it seemed like one of their main concerns is that 
the face, at least as far as they they think about how how they cash up what a face is, is always bound up in forms of political power. Um, and and they all they, they say that in a certain sense, the most basic way in which it enforces conformity to a rule um, is through uh, racism. Um, and that, that seems to be one of the overriding concerns in this chapter is trying to understand how racism works. And there's um there's a passage here which sort of maybe speaks to this idea of sort of normalization, or if that's how I want to think about it. They write that um, racism operates by the determination of degrees of deviance to the white man's face, which endeavors to integrate non-conforming traits into increasingly eccentric and backward waves, sometimes tolerating them at given places under given conditions in a ghetto, or sometimes erasing them from the wall, which never abides alterity. Um, so it, it, I guess I, my, my, my interpretation is that for them, the ways in which uh, faces are constructed is firstly always political, um, and that perhaps in it, its most sort of basic uh, expression of you know normalization, I guess, is is through uh, racism, which, as they say, it, it, well, at least they argue, yeah. is uh, the determination of degrees of deviance from the white man's face as kind of the the norm to which it must conform. I suppose. I mean, I, I obviously I agree with everything that's been set up and to this point. So I, I'm going to talk just a little bit about my own sort of uh, immediate reflections coming from this uh, text, which I think is going to dovetail with probably um, everybody else's and what's already uh, uh, come before here. So two of the fundamental things that seem to be said about faces in this text and in the plain ordinary sense is that um, how we commonly our common understanding of the face is that it is um individual it is pure it, that it is a matter of pure individuality and at the same time it is the ultimate kind of social embodiment of myself as a subject i am above everything else i am my face my relationship with other people is a relationship with a sea of faces that I encounter in which my face is a part. And what Deleuze and Guattari are denying here is the is that kind of romantic subject um embody subject embodiment in the face. Uh, the face is and this is why and you know this is something that we always see in Deleuze and Guattari, the use of the language of the machine of machinic language the idea that um the you know like, like we've already said that we slide into a face that, that that faces are actually ready made they exist before us and they ha- they have a being outside of ourselves and we find ourselves falling into um, a face here and how I, how i read that is on the one hand that very literally that we do understand all of us on some level that there is a correct way one wears one's face in different situations, um, depending on with whom one is interacting. I think it's a very plain literal sense of a, 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 a sense there. But as well as that, there's the, I, I, I can't help but think face does to some extent stand in for the, the entirety of our relationship with ourselves as subjects and 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 one of the things in particular that i find really interesting here and this is something that really comes out in their discussion about primitive societies who they state in a certain sense do not have faces they have heads that the face as the embodiment of the subject that can only happen through the denial of the of the body and the role that the body plays in myself as a social subject. And when they discuss um, primitive society, and to be clear, that is, that's that's their word, primitive, obviously. And uh, this is this is one of the things that you always kind of have with uh, a particular sort of like brand of uh, and moment of French philosophy, where everybody's also an, anthrop- an anthropologist. Uh, so there's always like an ever so slight concern. So yeah, but isn't this just kind of like what maybe some people thought in the 70s about some uh, communities they visited in different parts of the world? But uh, I, I, I digress. But yeah, but they did when they discuss societies without faces, in a sense, uh, primitive societies. The force of what they're saying there is when the imperialism of the face is that it reduces the role of the subject and the vocality of the subject into this single white hole, black hole machine. 
this particular surface of, as, as we've said, you know, this, this binary uh, mechanism of um, recognition and denial of passage through and rejection outwards, while the, well, the, the, for the primitive people where, where the face, there is no face because there is simply the head and the body, there is this polyvocality, there is this kind of embodied playfulness of being and playfulness of of becoming which you cannot have if you have a face because the meaning of the face is already decided before you wear it it is something that is assigned to you and in particular if we do take this as a kind of a stand-in for the subjectivity of the western man as such there is an inherent intense intense racialism and sexism and indeed heterosexism uh, and gender normativity all embodied in that because there's a way that a man's face is which is to which is distinct to a way a woman's face is and to a way a child's face is and in particular the way a white man's face is and you, and I, I remember once coming across a um a, 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 a scan or picture, a, a diagram from some like early 20th century German scientific racialist manual. And you see coming from that an obsession with faces and how faces look and how you can tell, no matter what someone's claimed nationality or language or citizenship is, you can tell if they're an Aryan by their face and the way you can tell if they're not by their face. And that, and, and, of, and which obviously is, you know, guess what I'm saying is, 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 is Balderdash. But it's not insignificant, I think, that what that the wall is white, in a very like quite a, a direct and plain and obvious sense. There's a reason why why the wall they're discussing here is a white wall, and as and, and as uh, and as we've already said here, there is this um, there's that wonderful passage there when it, when they discuss like the functioning of racism in fact it cannot really stand alterity it, there cannot be an other there can be degrees of sameness and degrees of deviation but there can never be a subject who or not sub subjects the wrong word obviously but there can never be a genuine encounter with another it can it can only ever be as it is brought into and categorized against the norm um and this is something that um as as we do move further into sort of like horrible fucking minority report facial recognition um technologies uh which you know and which, which, and, and indeed is, is already a reality they do already use like facial recognition software to spot people who look a bit terroristy uh and so on this is this is some this is one of those things where like Deleuze and Guattari are on the one hand obviously rich with like a beautiful illustrative metaphorical language which is also simultaneously completely literal and totally concrete one of the most fascinating things about what you're saying there about just thinking about sort of the the, the imperialist racialism of of the face and anthropology is to think about the ideas that Deleuze and Guattari have of how the face in a way it's it's not just content with the head it likes to move around but even on the head it expands beyond its own typical remit of the most immediate frontal areas of of the head. Because I'm thinking about phrenology mainly. The idea of creating this cartography which immediately criminalizes a kind of any difference from, you know, so it's, you know, the right brain pad, for example. And how it's just an an, an extent extension, sorry, of mode of, of, of observational kinds of reasons or stuff you see in Hegel's critique of phrenology. It's the idea of just the face as a kind of a kind of mapping kind of mapping which delimits in advance the not only the the, the sexual forms of, of, of formation upon certain parts of the body, such as the of the head, but also in a way delimits the capacity to which we have transformations. So for example, you know, contain things within the triad of, of the Oedipal triangle. Or I, I keep think I keep thinking we we talk about that about the idea of the, the transformational mask in a, in certain forms of uh, what in world theatre, the idea that there's a mask that opens up and there's different faces underlying it. There's a trans, so for example, you have one mask of a human, then it opens up, there's a mask of a, a pig or something, but there's a mask of an ape or something under that. And it's the idea of delimiting the possibilities of becoming in advance through this cartography of the face. And one of the most interesting things I have here is like just thinking about the idea of Christianization as the motor of this imperialism, how its representation functions, but also. Is is there a kind of transformation in sort of the Christianization model of facialization, just to 
keep rhyming it, um, which which may even escape even Deleuze and Guattari's points about the transformative power of that model. As as people who follow who listen who've heard the podcast and who follow me on Twitter at least will uh, will already know, but and and will suspect um, one of the things that obviously I found most interesting here was the discuss discussions about uh, Christianity in the face of Christ, uh, because because I am uh, for for my many various sins a practicing Christian, and the. But obviously, I found this very, tra- very, very <laughs> I found this quite challenging because they are, of course, right in what they're saying here. Ha- I have a lot of like thoughts about this, which aren't especially settled yet. So I'm going to just sort of wax lyrical a little bit and, and trust in the spirit of it here. But what they're saying is, in uh, in the face of in the face of Jesus, you kind of have like the par excellence example of the total facialization of of, of a person and the body, uh, where they where um, I'm tempted to actually just read uh, the passage, actually. Not only did Christ preside over the facialization of the entire body, his own, and the landscapification of all milieus, his own, but he composed all of the elementary faces and had every divergence at his disposal. Christ athlete at the fair, Christ mannerist queer, Christ negro, or at least the black virgin on the edge of the wall. The most prestigious, uh, the most prodigious strokes of madness appear on campus under the auspices of the Catholic Code. A single example chosen from many, Giotto, The Life of St. Francis, Scene 12, The Transfiguration. Against the white background of landscape and the blue and the black blue hole of the sky, the crucified Christ turned kite machine sends stigmata to St. Francis by rays. The stigmata affect the whole the facialization of the body of the saint in the image of the body of Christ. But the rays carrying the stigmata to the saints are also the strings Francis used to, uses to pull the divine kite. It was under the sign of the cross that people learned to steer the face and, pro- and processes of facialization in all directions. So, so obviously there's a lot going on there, and, and maybe to give a little bit of, um, I don't know if um, people here will be familiar with that particular piece of art, but it's, it's a very, it's one of like, I, I, like medieval devotional art it can be wonderfully strange and it's a real good example of that because christ appears in the sky above saint francis and it, it, it like he does look like a kind of laser firing kite machine because how he sort of is, is exploding out of the sky on the cross and out of uh the holy wounds fire these red rays which penetrate the body of the saint. and it is very strange it is kind of like one of those like peak examples of how strange medieval religion is and how alien it was to contemporary Christianity. And but um, what they're saying here is what is kind of depicted in this image is how um, the reception of Christ into into um, the settledness of religion involves um, all of the uh, all of the potentials, all the potential becomings in Christ. Um, being kind of like reduced down into this into this um facialization into this settledness and that's something that really interests me the idea of the set that um of the settledness of um of the face that it is something that like we've already said it's something that is decided in advance and there's a total delimiting of your possibilities one of the things that i took from this because obviously i want to try and wrestle with these ideas as a christian while still trying to be true to that tradition that I uh, that I'm a part of is the idea of trying to break Christ out of his own face, or treating. But if we if like because we, we have this land this language of the landscape, for instance, and I almost want to try and push with that to um, to try and have a kind of a reimagining of the meaning of Christ as less a settled territory as he could be a war zone. Because there is a, because we've already just mentioned the, politis, the politicization and the racialization of the face and how the, the, the production of the face is the production of the white man uh, for Deleuze and Guattari. And that is so just like absolutely true of how uh, Jesus is depicted culturally, especially in the West, where he is a white man, despite the obvious fact we're all aware of that the historical Jesus, of course, would not have been. He would not be considered racially white if we were to see him and there is and this is this kind of um abstraction from whatever person it was that was the historical font of the church into the imperial white christ and the empires of europe enacting his dominion of the world very you know through conquest for the extension of, of the market and for the extension of monarchical power at all parts of the world and so on 
I think bringing up medieval painting is really important to understanding this this chapter, especially uh, where he makes or where they make mention of Duccio's calling of Peter and Andrew. This this painting is paradigmatic of the the confluence of the facial semiotic and the landscape semiotic, in that we have the positioning of Christ in conjunction with Peter and Andrew. And of course, he's gesturing to them from the shores where they're out fishing in the water. And I'm not sure which one of the apostles is in the lead here, but one is looking fondly towards Christ and one is kind of tilted away. And the configuration of this painting is meant to be symbolic of a historical turn. But the more important aspect of the painting is the idea that the background, the gold leaf background, the depth is pushed up in conjunction with with Christ standing over the boat. And so the notion of the landscape kind of being pressed in the way that it does and, and the sort of, um, you know, the effective dimension or the effective quality of, of medieval painting, how it has this sort of kind of discombobulating, almost kind of a 3D effect to it, is intentional in some ways to produce the, the effective force of, of Christ's gaze. And also w- with regard to that, the idea of Christ as a white man is interesting because, of course, it's hotly debated as a historical topic. And you can see part of the response to um, to that debate is not merely disposing of the, the, the notion of medieval art or uh, art that depicts Christ as, as, as they did in medieval times, but then maybe reclaiming that style of iconography for your culture. And so in the notes, uh, it, when, when I did the outline for this show, one of the pictures that I put in was the, the Korean rendering of Christ. And, it, and it's interesting to see how the Catholic tradition in Korea has expanded and has adopted this iconography and then blended with, I, I guess you would say, the, the more Korean or more traditionally East Asian elements. But w- what's interesting is you're going to find different kinds of Christ in different areas of the world, but all of them are subordinated to this image of the white Christ, even if we see Christ rendered as a black man or a brown man, but we have Christ as the white man. And that figure is projecting into all the other figures which are producing sort of localized, ethnicized grids. The important aspect being not just that Christ is a white man, but it creates this dyad or this positionality between top and bottom, teacher and student, boss and employee. And this is the sort of move of binarization that's under critique here. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Again, I don't don't want to spend too much time on this particular uh, on this particular topic, but this is precisely what um, postmodern theologians and uh, contextual theologians, uh, and the one who most immediately comes to mind is is uh, Marcelo Althus, uh, Althus Reid, um, precisely are trying to challenge is the is that reception of the like there is like the correct imperial christ at the top and then the local deviations of it which we will kind of like tolerate as necessary evangelical efforts almost uh while understanding that european monarchical christ is still ultimately the correct one uh and 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 yes and what you do have with the various like movements within their uh, contextual theology and uh, various theologies of liberation is it is precisely this wanting to fully claim jesus as one's own um and there's the extent to which i think coming from the perspective that deleuze and Quattari have in necessity i think they would view that as still doomed and still a repetition of fascistic imperial structures but at the same time coming at it from a from a religious perspective i don't th- i think i don't know what other option there would be available uh to one if, if one does still want to to be a, a christian after to lose right except to sort of like to to bite the bullet and accept you know what we do all have to wear a face which is all and all faces are delimiting but we can but there is a, but um there's a difference between this kind of post face probe headedness that the losing Guattari sort of like say we need to aim for and being fa- and being faceless in the in, in in the actual context in which we live right now the state of being faceless isn't isn't 
preferable. It, it is destru- it, it is uh, destructive, it, and it gives opportunity to destruction. So there can still be a, a liberatory, emancipatory potential in claiming the face of the great, the great imperial archetype of Christ as one's own. I mean, as, as a gay man, this is kind of my relationship with my religion to an extent of, of seeing and hearing in Jesus, in Jesus' words an appeal to, to LGBT people in seeing ourselves as, as, as we are, as still dispossessed and still not re- lacking faces of our own that we have created uh, ourselves. We still have the faces that are being presented to us and handed down to us. And the necessity of creating faces of our own is still something that we we still need to do that because we still live in the world of faces, is what I'm trying to say, uh, I think, in quite a convoluted way. Uh, you know, we, we live in the world of faces. It's a question of like, and it, it's a question of whether or not the way in which you interact with the uh, the, the central eye, right? The black hole that captures everything. It, it's a question of, whether or not you can emit a a sort of signal that can become sort of imperceptible, right? Because it's a question of uh, ch- directly challenging those waves of sameness uh, that always try to eliminate things that reject identification, right? Um, so the challenge, the challenge for this political rejection of particular processes of subjectification is going to come down to how one can challenge the computation of normalities in the contemporary age right it it like it, it means eluding code right I, I, like not to bring everything back to to anti-oedipus but it it means to to attempt to find a way to to be like um to be like a thing that can't be directly uh, positioned or just entirely eliminated. One way that I would translate what you would what you just said there, Will, is that there's a risk in attempting to embrace a quote unquote line of flight, which may not be a line of flight, which is reinstalling the face by virtue of creating a face maybe that's different than the dominant face, but you import the the structure of the face uh, I- into your new new creation. What they're saying is, when, when they say at the end of the chapter, know your face, part of that involves knowing the partiality of your face, the way in which your face is comprised of different intersections of intensities. And there are ways in which we can... I, I guess I would say reclaim some of them, but not within the facial structure. There's a very good example uh, a trans friend of mine uh, had given to me in the context of a Deleuze and Gattari seminar that I had in college, where they saw their face at you know as becoming a trans person, you know, realizing they were trans and then coming out, and then having for themselves or availing themselves of the idea that as a trans woman it's fine to have a beard, right? Because the idea that we have about man and woman, we can see it in terms, of course, in these crass, strict, and and, and very pernicious binaries. But what if we were to break apart these traits to create something completely new? Yeah, no, and that's the that's always been the 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 transphobe's response to the trans person is to propagate what will end up being a sort of like violent argument about trying to reinstantiate like these strict binaries they're saying like oh like uh you you idiots want to abolish the 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 binary but then again like there are people who who want to valorize a particular set of affects because like they want to position themselves in such a way in relation to their femininity this way right and doesn't that in a certain sense just and and like no <laughs> right uh the, the the whole point is like so I, I i see exactly the risk that you're talking about right and that's that's the question of again the the sort of the these counter christs right so long as they're always in relation to the white christ that soars over the entire catholic discourse right and so long as they are always treated as just local manifestations of 
that broader thing, right? That so long as it's always treated like it's just another level of the genus, right? Another another articulation, uh, further and further away from this like central concept. And that's precisely how the imperialism of the face works: is that you have these proxies which function in virtue of that that larger valorized face. Yeah, and I couldn't help but read this in like a Foucauldian sense as pertaining to normalizing power and normalizing judgment in those, you know, briefly medical sections of discipline and punish where he's Foucault's basically saying like we we create like these these centralized norms and then we just articulate uh you know distances away from that. Um and I think that that's sort of the the that's the the imperialistic terrorizing nature of the of the white Christ all the way through to the imperialistic terrorizing nature of the 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 turf you know the bad faith turf I mean they're they're, they're, they're both modeled on the English so of course they're imperialistic <laughs> bastards but yeah you know, um, <laughs> every episode yeah I, mean, yeah I I do like this idea of you you know the the the, the counter Christ because I keep thinking about the idea of being clandestine and avoiding subjectivation avoiding the face you know, avoiding faciality, becoming faceless. And I'm, I'm wondering, to the extent to which, you know, just, just just doing this radical rejection of subjectification, of presenting uh, to, as anything, as of being represented at all, it kind of feels like, unless there's actually like a line of flight, unless you're going somewhere, you're not really making uh, any kind of actual sort of um, radical self-transformation. You're, so, you're simply avoiding form in, in, in general, to be honest. I keep thinking of the Audrey Lord quote, you know, your silence will not save you. I think this is this is where the idea of seizing the means of subjectivation comes in. You know, to you know, queering Christ, seizing Christ. Otherwise these machines are going I mean, if you don't if you don't want to have a face, one will be found for you at the end of the day. And I'm wondering to what extent with faciality there's a, a, a danger of going too far, you know, destratifying too far and becoming a fascist, to quote, you know, Comrade Cooper. This is something that uh you know, there are frequent warnings in Deleuze and Guattari's writings. It comes up, it comes surprised how much it comes up, actually, how often that warning comes up. That um, on a the line, there are, you know, and uh, it's put, they put it so this way in uh, the, superior to, the superiority of Anglo American literature that um, there is no guarantee on a line of flight that we will not encounter mummy daddy um, once again. Uh, as as we as we follow this trajectory, that and this is why, and I think this is one of the things that makes Deleuze and Guattari such uh, attractive figures is it's not often you encounter a philosophy which is knowingly dangerous uh, and and alerts you to the danger of going too far with this. And they say and then they say the same in uh, in this chapter. In fact, you know they did they warn that you. Know, this can just destroy you. You can just go mad uh, doing this, and that's that's the same warning that you find in uh, how to make yourself a body without organs, and uh, and and maybe that's what happens at the end of uh, the geology of morals, where um, a challenger uh, just like turns into a Randolph into a Randolph Carter, so like liquid crab man uh, is a similar a similar warning put into action there. That um, there is, a, yeah, I think. Ultimately, what, what's being said here is that, that there simply are no guarantees in the struggle for uh, emancipation. That it can, there is the, the possibility of restoring every single thing we were fleeing from is always imminent. Is always imminent, and at, at the same time, there, there is surely no other option than to build a church to, to the counter Christ all the same. Uh, that, um, you know, we do have, we do find ourselves in a world of limited possibilities and we find ourselves with the tools that have been made available to us already. And there's only, there are only so many possibilities open to us. There's only so many options if we do want to live a life which is as sane as possible and obviously and you know it's 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 almost comical to the extent this is literally enacted in the life of nick land um obviously you know how how his his, his pursuit of um absolute deterritorialization uh it, it, through the 90s leads to just the you know fucking brexit racist dad he is on um, twitter now mr land you believe in absolute deterritorialization and yet you're still on this fucking planet uh, can you please discuss? <laughs> Checkmate. Oh man, the violence. But no, like that that's the that's the risk, right? So 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 Cooper, I'll I'll bring it up like a third time. He makes the joke about you destratify too quickly and you end up absolutely susceptible 
to to instead of these relative or partial reterritorializations that will always be occurring alongside, right? Um, any sort of destabilizing uh, act of decoding or deterritorialization. Uh, de instead, you attempt to like pursue this line of flight of complete and total uh, deterritorialization, and then you end up with a total, just complete re-manifestation of the fascist, right? Look, the thing about land is that like part of those seeds will all were always present in pieces like uh cotton capital and the prohibition of incest but like it, it, with, with i think uh you know uh mark fisher's comment where he brings it to the point of both a personal and philosophical auto-induced uh you know breakdown is is a good is a good warning right um but i i wonder in this in this act of because again we get this notion of the figure the figure of of refusal, and I know that this, this is one of Craig's focuses in his work um, of the of the uh, of the units that resist identification, um, and that those are the ones that the the this sort of the social face needs to immunize itself from. I, I wonder, does resisting identification necessarily mean resisting a face? I don't know if that's true in this in this plateau. I, I, I don't I don't have a good answer to that one, but I wanted to very quickly add something to um, something that Sean was talking about about the idea of these um, uh, line, lines of flight sort of being uh, you know sort of op openly dangerous, right? But Deleuze and Guattari sort of accept the danger of you know the riskiness of these endeavors sort of in advance of them, um, which is that uh, so Michael Hart has some really useful notes for both anti Oedipus and for Thousand Plateaus. And um, in his discussion of the following plateau, um, he has a he takes a few passages I think were qu quite useful for thinking through, uh, I guess the contingency and danger present in any line of flight, whether that's um, the dissolution of the face as they openly call for, um, or, or anything else. Um, so Hart, Hart writes that um, uh, there's no assurance. Well, Deleuze writes that um, there is no assurance that two lines of flight will prove compatible, compossible. There is no assurance that the body of our organs will be easy to compose, and there's no assurance that a love or a political approach will withstand it. And so, Hart adds to that that uh, lines of flight have to meet, and in the encounter, have to compose together a new relationship. Um, that encounter is not given; it's rather the task of love to discover compatible, compossible lines. Um, and he uh, draws out the comparison between love and politics, which is interesting when approaching it. Um, so I just wanted to just add, add that, that um, this is sort of an idea that Deleuze and Atari explore at length. And I guess I, I, I've seen this sort of leveled against Deleuze and Atari as a kind of critique sometimes, right? Um, like, how do we know these lines of flight are worth uh, following? Um, and Deleuze and Atari is going to say, well, we don't, right? We won't know until we uh, try it and see whether it works. Um, and so I, I, when, I, when I see that sort of, put back against Mazur critique, I always think that it's sort of, we're looking for easier answers, easy sort of simple answers here where, you know, if we do X, then the good thing, Y, that we want to happen will happen, right? Um, and the whole thing for Deleuze and Qatari is that we can't guarantee this. Um, so although they're going to call for this, sort of this dissolution of the face, I think they call it, um, of course, as, as Sean said, it is no guarantee that this gets us the result that we're hoping for. Will, can you recast your question about representation again? Yeah, the, que the question about refusal is like, there's this notion that they, they return to the signifying chain. They talk about uh, how racism operates by a determination of degrees of deviance from the white man. And then finally says that racism never detects the particles of the other. It propagates waves of sameness until those who resist identification have been wiped out. Now, obviously, this is an allusion to um, Fanon, or, uh, but I wonder this notion of resisting identification. Are they talking about figures who resist the very notion of possessing a face? Or is it that they refuse to slide in, right? You don't you don't create a face so much as you slide in. Are they are they resisting faciality as such? Or are these figures 
that are resisting identification, those who possess faith, like black holes or particles that cannot be detected and then therefore must be immunized. I think one of the things, uh, well, there's a couple terms to bring in here. I'm thinking of the analytic philosophy classes that I take, have taken, like vagueness, border cases, and that sort of thing. I think they're thinking about in, entities that maybe lie on the edge of instantiating certain categories or certain identities across a set of binaries. And, and what they say in the text is, is that if you have enough of these build up over time, if you have ambiguous cases, new categories will be created and uh, new binaries effectuated as a result. And so part of the political praxis or the ethical praxis here is to become the kind of particle that never gets in to one of those things. And the, what, the, the sort of paradigmatic example they go back to is, is the child at play. So when you watch a child playing, maybe they have a balloon, maybe they have a stick, they're playing in the mud, they're jumping around. They are moving in a way that traverses all sorts of nomadic lines that are irreducible to any sort of, oh, okay, they're playing in this manner. This is the, this is the sort of game they're playing. These are the kind of rules they're playing by. But a, a child who's unbound, unwatched by any parental or authority figure um, is going to play in this sort of manner. And so they're using that example to say, like, how can you construct a political praxis that emulates this, this figure of the child, right? Or, you know, as I said in a recent uh, blog post that I interacted with Matt C on, these are the intensities of the child. And, and here's the real political challenge, I think, especially when it comes to racial politics, is do you affirm the model of representation in some ways? Do you become Nike Corporation and do a Black Lives Matter campaign to proliferate capital? Or do you take a sort of uh, a posture that refuses to become racialized in the name of capital and connects with other kinds of intensities that do not allow capital to re-territorialize upon the figure of race. So this is the challenge, I think, these days specifically with the Black Lives Matter movement. Like, it does it get sold out to these major corporations? Or are Antifa protesters in Portland, Oregon, smashing the window at the Nike store in downtown? So just a brief aside that uh, it's interesting taken from this that uh, Jesus was clearly a delusion um, because the figure of the child is, is, is some, and this is one of the most like frequently like quoted the most well-known verses from, uh, from the gospels, but you know, that uh, Jesus specifically uses the figure of the child as the exemplar of, uh, of the Christian saying that, you know, it, it is, you know, take it, you know, picking the child up and say, you must become like the child to enter into the kingdom, and it's one of those incredibly like ambiguous statements that uh, that, that he makes, which can be re- and and obviously you can read this. He's saying this, well, you must have like the simple sort kind of like thoughtless trust that a child has. But at the same time, you know, that's a very narrow and quite I think quite bad faith interpretation of that statement. And that, how that has always struck me is precisely what Deleuze Guattari is saying there. That what is what has been praised there is precisely the 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 playfulness and the inventiveness and kind of like the plasticity of childhood there. Mm. that there is that Absolutely. um and because uh, i do have like quite i mean I, i'm a heretic right you know i, I have quite i have quite <laughs> and i do have like quite uh like frequently quite mystical sort of interpretation of a lot of these things and that is how i see this uh but but what what's being said there that you know to inherit the kingdom like a child is to have is to play is to have is, is for it to be a joyful and playful thing uh where there is where where, where you know there is no law there is no uh, there is no law no guilt uh only only do what thou wilt um and but and how there is and and this being taken as a kind and obviously and obviously maybe a lot of the risk of what uh, Deleuze and Guattari are talking about can also be made present there as well because you know there's you know there's very little um moral impulse withholding a child from um you know, pulling wings off a fly in the same way that, um, you know, a child is still also did like a repository of just like absolute um, joy. This can also just very easily be a sadistic malice in, in, in the same, at the same time. No, I think, I think that's right. I, 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 you know, I've always like, I, the knife falls a particular way for me on that, uh, that take of for, for, uh, from Craig on the child and, uh, the anarchist, right. Um, 
because in a sense, right, the child, if we talk about well, what is it that the, the if there is a human destiny, it is to escape the face, right? It's to always move towards the the escape of 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 the face as as such, or to dismantle the face and facializations, which I guess is different. Um, and for for me, in a sense, this this notion of the child, like the concept of the central eye isn't there like imperceptibility is not even necessarily an issue right it it propagates sort of a productive playfulness as you say and maybe like i'm falling too much into like the, the post heideggerian uh, trap by talking about that sort of stuff but um i wonder if these acts of uh these acts of like pure you know armed joy right the 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 protesters who destroy the nike store rather than attempting to to rally it to possess a particular you know political disposition in this or that ad right if that is actually an act of becoming sort of clandestine or at least like refusing the way in which like capital must facialize uh, the notion of like socio political progress. I mean, temporally, they're quite different in the sense of which you should only become clandestine to the extent in which you can only be recognized whilst in the midst of constructing an insurgent re entry into the sphere of which you're trying to do combat. Yeah, it's the question of the closet or the war room, right? Exactly. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can just have concluding comments on the. The text, Sean, you can go first. What did you like, or would you? What are you taking from this? Oh, good God! Uh, what's up? I I love I loved all of it. I as as it's it's one of the easier texts I've read from um, Deleuze and Guattari in a certain sense, although it is still very difficult. I think I just keep on comparing everything to how horrible Geology of Morals was to read, which is one of the most difficult, oh, one of the it's, most it's, difficult, it's, impossible yeah. things I've ever read. So <laughs> everything's a walk in the park compared to that. Uh, I liked that it had all of the greatest hits that, you, that uh, I've come to expect from Deleuze and Guattari to the extent that I'm almost wondering if I shouldn't start a little bingo thing whenever i read them so are they going to mention henry miller are they going to mention dh lawrence uh and, in, and indeed they do um i found it it's everything that i love about them that it that it's um going after a very odd target the face and the making of the face and dismantling it in a in a fascinating way which god i don't want to just, just like end with a kind of like wow makes you think moment there but sort of, yeah, like that it does um, by by coming up, by going after the face, by by announcing that, that the face, that faces are entirely contingent to history and to empire and to capital. That it does just throw open the floodgates to, uh, to, to literally everything and I'm, I'm revealing the contingency of, of absolutely everything that we've received as as necessary um yes uh and uh, and yeah and i'm gonna i'm gonna stick with my take that uh, jesus is a delusion uh i'm gonna have stuff i think i'm gonna run with and i love will your i don't know if this i don't know if this is um uh a, a, a coinage of yours or if it's just a phrase i've not come across but i did love i love the phrase counter christs uh i think that's i think that i think that's actually <laughs> i think that is actually possibly quite a useful sort of concept to take uh that i'll be taking away from this Thank well you. you can take it you, it's yours that's our black metal band all five of us <laughs> it's not it's between un, some unblack nor black metal bands <laughs> pure, okay, okay pure tangent have you heard of uh river raw room if no uh i don't want to call them christian metal though they are very literally that but they define themselves like very specifically as roman catholic black metal not as unblack metal or white metal but as black metal which embod embodying all of like the the sheer raw violent negation inherent in black metal but putting this through but while but this being kind of like the catholic renunciation of the world basically and it's the only it's the only christian metal band i've ever come across who actually work because they are foremost black metal and it is actually some of the most just like horrible screeching 
like nasty black metal I've ever heard, but they're also Catholics. It's fantastic. I'll we'll, I'll uh, uh, I'll DM you. Um, I'll actually I'll, I'll put it in the chat in here because please. it's uh, but yeah, it's that that's just genuinely really really fantastic. Final points: one, best Christian black metal bands; one, liturgy; two, Batushka, because they're also very Delersian. Because you can never tell if there's one Batushka or several of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, one or several uh, yeah. the faciality plateau didn't talk enough about eyes eyes are the things that do the capturing they have these bordering effects little pores around the black holes you know uh, eyes more problematic than faces for me um, overall the Christian imperialism stuff pretty well articulated but and I'm glad they articulate the danger of going too far in the anti facializing direction but I think understanding the mechanisms of faciality is going to be a, a you know a good thing in terms of becoming clandestine in order to you know, become unrecognised until the act of, uh, of insurrection, let's say. And um, this is my first full plateau. I, I found it quite enjoyable. I mean, it's, it's not a bad one to start on. It's not the worst one to start on by any means. And I think if you, get, if you have to spare time, it's uh, literally the shortest one so far. And it's probably the most, the, the most rich in terms of its density, in terms of its critique of representation. Yeah, no, I, I enjoyed it as well. Um, I... I've, one, one, the connections I, I found interesting were, I think Daniel Turk wrote about this, which is this kind of implicit critique of Levinas, that like Levinas' ethics is based upon the, the sort of demands that the face of the other places upon us implicitly. Um, and so on the one hand, it's it, like Deleuze and Guattari are trying to get away from this idea that ethics is kind of um, derivative of these kind of... Uh, uh, relationships between firstly between uh, your your face and that face, but also the construction of the other as this kind of dialectical negation of negation, um, which is what they try to explore in terms of their account of uh, racism, I guess. Which is one of the, the sort of key threads in this chapter is like the way in which faciality uh, sort of constructs and enforces racism in its own way. Um, so I, I found it interesting, really interesting thinking about all that sort of stuff. Um, I think I, I agree with both Sean and um, Adam that like it, it's it's a lot, it's a difficult chapter, but it's certainly one of the easier ones that I've encountered from A Thousand Plateaus. Um, and the, the, the connections you can kind of draw from this and sort of expand outwards with is it's one of those really refreshing things about a book like this. I guess that leaves me and I will just leave you all with this. Yes, the face has a great future but only if it is destroyed, dismantled, on the road to the ace signifying and the ace objective.
Thank mm-hmm. you.